land of the long white cloud. Aotearoa, the name the Maoris gave New Zealand as they drew near its mythical shores a thousand years ago. Those old adventurers came in canoes thrusting into the unknown, braving storms, sailing southward and still further southward, till after months of endless sea and empty sky, they saw a long white cloud lying on the horizon. The long white cloud that resolved itself into New Zealand, the long look for unknown land. But times have changed. And today, the traveller comes by sea or air along well-charted routes to find a civilised community that counts itself among the nations of the modern world. It's only a little over a century since the first English settlers came to these remote islands in the Pacific and began to lay the foundations of the New Zealand of today. The poetic cloud shape that made the old Maori navigators shout with joy has changed into cities, farms, modern buildings, transport services, and the civilized pattern of living of a young and virile nation. New Zealand today has a population of over a million and three quarters. The land is fertile, the people are prosperous, and the future is before them. Auckland, with its quarter million inhabitants, is the largest city in the Dominion, a commercial and industrial center and a busy port from which millions of tons of foodstuffs are shipped every year to Great Britain and other countries. During the past 10 years, the government has undertaken great housing schemes throughout the Dominion. There's nothing shoddy about these houses. They're built to last, and plenty of room has been left for young New Zealand to enjoy fresh air and sunshine and healthy exercise. These, perhaps, are future all-black footballers. There is no need to say, of course, that rugby football is the national game. New Zealand has a temperate climate, and nearly every house has its garden. Big homes, small homes. It's the same everywhere you go from one end of the country to the other. If you come in summer, you'll see roses like these blooming in suburban gardens. At all seasons of the year, you'll find flowers round the homes of New Zealanders and vegetables too. But there's nothing to outshine the roses of summertime. High above these tropical canna lilies rises the tower of the Auckland University College. Not far away, the War Memorial Museum gives dignity to the skyline, as do many of Auckland's fine churches. The harbour and the gulf beyond are one of the world's yachting grounds. In the summertime, over 2,000 yachts and launches move through the blue waters of the Waitemata. If it comes up rough and you don't like white horses, there are the other colours. 
New Zealanders are just as fond of horse racing as anybody else, and perhaps a little fonder. The big race meetings are among the most brilliant sporting and social events of the year. Totalisator betting is very popular with the crowd. During the last ten minutes before each race, the excitement and the bustle rise to a climax. Those who've placed their bets take things easy before the excitement begins all over again. Then there's the rush to see the race run, to follow the horses as they come round from the back of the course. Jockeys' colours have become confused, horses have been obscured, one or two have fallen, but now everything begins to grow clearer as they come round the corner for the last time and move up into the street. Here they are, thundering along the level turf, the pressure's on, crowd are expectant, anxious, the leaders are beginning to show up. Here they come, right along in front of the stand. Certainty is beginning to grow. This is the Great Northern Steeplechase, one of the big events in the life of the Auckland racegoer. They're fighting for it. The leaders are going all out. There they go past the finish. Well, I suppose some of the punters were lucky. The hot sunshine delights holiday crowds, but it also forms the chief stock in trade of one of the growing industries of the North Island. Within a few miles of Auckland, thousands of acres of grapes have been developed, and a rich wine industry has sprung up during the past few decades. Of course, some people like them just as they come from the vine, deep purple with the bloom on them and full of the goodness of the sun. This Maori boy is eating sunshine. He belongs to one of the proudest races on earth and stands on an equal footing with his Pākehā, or white schoolmate. The signing of the Treaty of Waitangi in 1840 sealed a covenant between the Māori and Pākehā races. In consideration thereof, Her Majesty the Queen of England extends to the natives of New Zealand her royal protection and imparts to them all the rights and privileges of British subjects. And that means, and may peace last forever between Maori and Pākehā. The Treaty House at Waitangi was built by the first resident magistrate, James Busby, soon after he arrived from England in 1833. The historic Treaty of Waitangi was signed just in front of this building. In 1933, the Treaty House was bought by the then Governor General, Lord Bledisloe, and presented to the people of New Zealand, Māori and Pākehā. These scarlet hibiscus flowers make us think of Hawaii and other Pacific Islands, and that is very fitting, because it was from those faraway islands that the Māoris came to New Zealand. It was here, in this very place, where they grow so prolifically, that the Māori people became united with the Pākehā people of the British race. In the Bay of Islands, there are many historic memories for both races. Here in the far north, the New Zealand of today had its beginning. In these days, the Bay of Islands has become famous as one of the world's best deep sea fishing grounds. If we take the coast road north for 30 miles, we come to another beautiful harbour, Wangaroa, where the fishing is good too. Swordfish and Marco sharks weighing hundreds of pounds are caught in the waters off this coast, and sportsmen come from all over the world to fish for them. One of the nice things about fishing is that it's usually done in pleasant surroundings, and the Wangaroa Harbour provides a perfect background for the summer fishing holiday. Many a huge fish has been brought in by launch from the deep waters outside the harbour and hung up proudly on the jetty. The Maori people call the East Coast the Woman Coast, and the West Coast they call the Man Coast, and that should tell you the difference. Here over on the Man Coast is the Hokianga Harbour, Away out on the bar there are huge rollers crashing in and on the long beaches and the gaunt headlands the Tasman Ocean thunders unceasingly. The traveller feels he must stop and look and if he comes at evening he will see the sunset sky throwing its reflections on the broad reaches of the Hokianga, one of the wildest and loveliest places in New Zealand. Dairy farming is one of the biggest industries in the North Island and when the farmer has sent his cream to the dairy factory, he has lots of skim milk available for pig farming. New Zealand produces three quarters of a million of these glamorous creatures every year, and the greater number of them are given a sea trip to Britain and other countries to feed hungry people. All right, girls and boys, don't rush it. You'll catch the ship, all right. These are a little further along the road to breakfast and they'll grow up just to look like the old folks. 
This solid character is going to make lots of fine breakfasts. There's some lovely scenery here, but it's sights like this that are so satisfying. When we'd seen something of the north, we went back to Auckland and then set off for Rotorua, the famous inland holiday ground. We crossed the broad Waikato River at Hamilton, which is the centre of the biggest dairy farming district in the Dominion, and went on through Cambridge. And that was something very different from the north, just a little piece of England lifted up and planted down here in the southern hemisphere. Sentiment is one thing, however, and stern practicality is another. Carapuro, with its artificial lake, is only one of the big hydroelectric power stations built by a later generation of New Zealanders. On we went through broad farmlands, across rolling plains, and through the Mamaku Gorge, and came at last to Rotorua. There may be some things that simply aren't done, but there are some places that simply are done, and Rotorua is one of them. We took a quiet stroll through the gardens and watched them playing croquet. And then, of course, we couldn't resist swimming in the celebrated blue bath with its warm mineral water brought up out of the depths of the earth. If we'd been suffering from rheumatism, we'd have investigated the bathhouse with its hot mud baths and other treatments. But we were feeling pretty fit after a spell in the north, so we went out to the golf links. We'd been told a lot about them before we ever got to Rotorua, there's something about this Rotorua course that makes them come back year after year. A strange beauty and a sort of topographical charm that casts a spell on the most hardened golfer. And that's saying a good deal. Quite close to the links at Wakarewarewa, or Waka as they call it for short, we saw a real Maori pa. A pa, it's spelled P-A, is a sort of combined village and fort. Notice how the Maori people greet each other when they meet by pressing noses. This greeting is called the Hongi. Of course, they don't live in this fashion nowadays, but at Rotorua they keep this model pa. And they're always glad to show the visitors how things used to be done and to demonstrate their traditional games and crafts. This stick game is harder than it looks. And by the way, this and several other old Maori games have been adopted by the physical education teachers in modern New Zealand schools as a training in rhythm and the skillful use of hand and eye. Some of the things we saw at Rotorua impressed us. If we're to judge races by their skill and craftsmanship, by their arts and crafts, and the way they handle materials, then the Maori race is indeed a cultured one. These girls do many things with flax and raupo grass, and just now they're making baskets out of flax. The green part of the flax is scraped away with a mussel shell, and then the fibrous part is woven skillfully into shapes. These baskets are used to put food in, and food is cooked in them too. Here at Rotorua, where they have plenty of free cooking facilities in the way of boiling pools, the baskets of food are filled and suspended in a pool. You're perhaps wondering whether the food is tainted by the fumes of sulphur. The answer is no, not the slightest bit. Here they're making poise. They make these little balls out of raupo grass and tie them on the end of a string. And then they twirl them to the rhythm of their song. The most elaborate poi was the canoe poi, where girls give a representation in terms of art of the original war canoes of the first migration to New Zealand.
guide Rangi has met many of the great ones of the earth in her time and has shown thousands of visitors round Rotorua. There's something a bit frightening about the hot pools and fumaroles of Rotorua when you meet them for the first time, but you get used to them. You find boiling pools sometimes right beside cold running water in which trout swim. This is the world's most efficient kitchen with every age-old convenience for the chef. And close by, you'll find lukewarm pools where the Maori boys swim. That lad on the left hasn't got mumps. His mouth's full of pennies. Visitors throw them and the boys dive for them. This kind of thing makes you feel a bit uncomfortable at first, but it's fascinating. They call this mud pool the rose and the lily. There are plenty of others that make different patterns, some white or grey, others pink. Wood carving is one of the arts the Maori people brought to a state of perfection unsurpassed anywhere else in the world. Buildings, canoes, weapons and implements were elaborately carved and the patterns all had a particular significance. Motifs of the same kind were used in the tattooing of the faces of those of high birth. Dignity and pride of race and the memory of a great past are stamped on the faces of many of the old Maoris. In the days before the white man came, they were a fierce, spirited people, brave and generous, and their warmth of humanity, their courage and their great communal spirit are still active today in the honourable partnership of Māori and Pākehā. The memorials of their past are admired and cherished by white New Zealanders who take pride in showing them to the visitors, almost as if they were their own. This is the Pupakura geyser, which has played for as long as the Māori can remember. There's a cold trout pool right beside it, by the way. You can wander around for days looking at the geysers and boiling pools of Rotorua and wondering how the crust of the earth can be so thin at this point without something awful happening. But you won't find a more splendid sight than Pohutu geyser. When Pohutu plays, one can almost imagine that the sun stands still in the heavens to watch these great plumes scattering on the breeze. After spending a day looking at steaming rocks and frantic mud, you may feel that peace is something unknown here until you go out to the trout spring. Here, the demon who rules over the thermal regions has resigned his office. It must be some gentle dryad who watches over this place. A day long, year long, the trout moves through the green half-light of the pool, weaving endless patterns in the silence. The water looks about 18 inches deep, but actually it's about 10 feet. It's so crystal clear that it creates the illusion of shallowness. What a strange world this is, to live always in the green twilight. Do you remember that poem of Rupert Brooks about the fish? In a cool, curving world he lies and ripples with dark ecstasies. That big fellow is supposed to weigh over 20 pounds, by the way. After we'd seen Rotorua, they took us out to another weird place, the Tikatiri Valley. Not the sort of place to go to if you've got a bad conscience. They call it Hell's Gate. <laughs> but why only the gate? Looks like the centre of things. One of our last impressions of Rotorua was the quiet-mannered shyness of her Maori people. This girl, a descendant of the famous chief Honohiki, although dressed up in the finery of her ancestors to show us how they used to look, was actually a fully qualified nurse in a modern hospital. In the evening, we took a stroll down to the edge of Lake Rotorua to see Mokoya Island in the fading light of the sunset. Very lovely, very calm, after all the brimstone and sulphur of Tikatiri. Next day, we packed our gear in the car and set out again. We travelled along the road they call Hongi's Track, after one of the most famous of the Maori warriors. This motor road was originally the track Hongi hacked through the virgin bush to transport his 90-foot war canoe overland to surprise an enemy expecting him by water. By the roadside is the wishing tree of Chieftainess Hinehopu, a tree famous in recounted legend as having saved her life. And now you must propitiate her as you pass by by laying down a fern leaf, or rain and storms will follow you, and at the same time you can make a wish. So let this be my wish, that many people who've never set foot in New Zealand may be able to visit the Dominion and see the mountains and the lakes and the great forests in reality. Southward again, down and across the Bay of Plenty and through the Wairika Gorge, southward to Gisborne. 
This prosperous town is the hub of the great farming district, known oddly enough as Poverty Bay. That was the name Captain Cook gave it. But it has an ironical sound today. No place ever belied its name so much as Poverty Bay. For through this port of Gisborne, millions of tons of beef, mutton and wool have been sent overseas and production is still rising. Gisborne is a spacious town with broad streets and because its life is built on farm production, its prosperity is firmly established in the world of today. Like all New Zealand towns, Gisborne has its flower gardens and public reserves. Apart from being a busy port, it's a favourite holiday place. All along this east coast, there are magnificent surf beaches, and Gisborne is one of the places where the swimmer finds himself right in his element. New Zealanders are all keen swimmers, and in coastal districts, children live in the water as they play. And even inland, swimming is part of the school curriculum. The trouble is to keep the pupils out of the baths. If you're tough, you do it this way, of course. New Zealanders can play hard and they can work hard too. With a hungry world waiting for supplies of food stuff, New Zealand farmers are doing their best to increase the yield from the fertile lands of the Dominion. The beef industry is one of the most important branches of farming. Three quarters of a million cattle are killed every year and two thirds of them are exported to Britain. It's a great life, and you know you're doing a useful job. Don't look at me. No, <laughs> we're not in Texas. This is New Zealand. Of course, the farmers aren't the only people in the beef industry. The preparation of beef carcasses is a job for experts. A very highly skilled business indeed. Food, food, and still more food. That's the cry today in a world where hunger stands on millions of doorsteps. Food and warmth. And for warmth, we need wool. Here on the east coast of New Zealand, the emphasis is on sheep. Tens of thousands of sheep are shorn every year. Bales and bales of wool are dispatched to be used locally or sent across the sea to colder lands. There are some very big sheep stations in the Poverty Bay district. And there are plenty of smaller ones too, where simple farmsteads set in pleasant natural surroundings beside a river or on the edge of a patch of bush provide homes for the settlers. It's not all beer and skittles, this business of sheep farming, but it has its compensations. They live close to the land, these people, and that means health of body and mind. Since the dawn of history, farming has been the basic industry of society, without which civilization could never have happened. And its vital importance has been impressed upon us very deeply. New Zealand is a farming country first and foremost, and New Zealanders are proud of the way in which their great primary industries have been built up over the years. Our grandfathers could hardly have believed that such a huge expansion was possible. But by hard work and the application of scientific knowledge, the thing has been done. There are something like 30 million sheep in New Zealand, and the wool, mutton and fat lamb are eagerly sought after. Warmth, deep, soft warmth, to be made into clothes for somebody. It's not going to stay where it is for long. How would you like it? Just a bit of a trim up? No, oh, I think we better have the whole lot off. Make a clean sweep of it. The summer's here, and after you get outside, you'll feel the benefit. After you get used to it. It doesn't take long to shear a sheep, if you know how. And this man's an expert. He takes the wool off in great swathes. Look at it. Solid wealth, coming off the back of a sheep. Wool. One of the foundations of New Zealand's prosperity. The Greeks had a name for it. They called it the Quest of the Golden Fleece. It takes a good many of these to make up a bale of wool, of course. They're packed down tightly in wool presses under heavy pressure, and then the bales are loaded and sent away to the wool stores. Eventually they'll be sold and find their way into the hands of the manufacturers to be made into clothing, blankets, materials, and the finest traveling rugs in the world. Wool is a four-letter word meaning comfort.
After seeing Gisborne, we pushed on further down the east coast, sometimes passing drovers with their flocks of sheep, and came to Napier, another big farming centre and port, and a popular winter health resort. But it isn't only in the winter that Napier opens its arms to the visitor. The Esplanade stretches for nearly two miles, and great waves come rolling in from the Pacific. And in the summertime, Napier is a gay place. Surf bathing, roller skating, sunbathing, Yes, they know how to have fun in Napier. The seaside swimming pool has its attractions too. Beautiful! Lovely to do and lovely to watch. The long seafront of Napier is laid out with gardens and lawns on the very brink of the Pacific Ocean. Napier lies in the southern corner of Hawke's Bay, and if you follow the bay southward a short distance, you come to Cape Kidnappers, where the sea swirls among the rocks and the wind blows free, and the seabirds wheel and cry above, and send their shadows flitting across the sand. This great white rock is the home of the Gannets, the only Gannet sanctuary in the world that is on the mainland. Here is the empire of the Gannets. When man intrudes, they treat him with disdain, unless he becomes too familiar, in which case he gets a peck in the legs. This looks like a little domestic argument. All right, all right, don't nag at me. They wheel against the blue of the sky and the ocean, moving in great sweeping curves. Here is life stripped to the bone, simplified down to nothing but rock and wind and sea and fish. Fish that are brought up out of the sea by the birds, diving into the blue waves. Yet here in this extremity of bleakness, they breed and nurture their young, hatching, feeding, coddling them, protecting them from the wild elements. Those are Government Railways Department buses going over to Taupo. Taupo, where they do all the fishing? Well, let's go. Wild horses can't stop me from going to Taupo. Well, look at that, will you? Now, Taupo simply mustn't be missed. Taupo, that great inland lake where fishermen gather from all parts of the globe. And so, after we'd seen the east coast, away we went across a magnificent country. And sure enough, we met some wild horses. Not one of these has ever felt a bit in his teeth. Now, come on, line up. We'll take a snap of you. Come on. Yeah, that's better. That's the way. Now, look at the camera. Good. We'll post you the proofs. With memories of the seacoast fresh in our minds, the calm beauty of lake water was like soft music after the crashing chords of a symphony. Blue water and poplars shedding their gold at the water's edge. In New Zealand, you get used to the grandeur of the evergreen bush, but here and there you see English trees standing out vividly against the background of the native landscape, as here beside the Hooker Falls. All through this countryside, as in many parts of New Zealand, there are rivers flowing down from the hills to the sea. And in most of these rivers, there are trout. You've heard about salmon leaping the rapids. The New Zealand trout also battles its way up to the mountain shallows. In just a moment or two, you'll see a waterfall. And if you watch carefully, you'll see the trout leaping up the fall in the Aratiatia Rapids, believe it or not. Be ready now. Now, here we are. You'll see the trout leaping in just one second. There, did you see that? Now here's another one. There, did you see it? You'll see quite a few of them if you stayed here for long. They move up through all this tremendous boisterous water. There's no stopping them. All the rivers and streams flowing into Lake Taupo have trout in them. But the best 
and most famous of them all is the Tongariro River. Fly fishing isn't only a sport. Isaac Walton made the world aware of that a very long time ago. It's a delicate art as well. And when the fight is over, it's satisfying to hold a nice, big, shiny trout in your hand. And when the sun goes down at the end of a splendid day, it's good to see a sight like this. Yes, a little gloating is permissible. On the road again, we drove round the shores of Lake Taupo and out across to the Chateau Tongariro with Ruapehu, 9,000 feet high, towering in the background. There's plenty to do here. Skiing? Well, of course. And even if you're not an expert, you can have a lot of fun. If you want to get away from it all, something to brush the cobwebs away, then skiing may be the answer. But you mustn't be prepared to stand on your dignity. You may be lucky if you can stand on anything at all, even your own two feet. Still, there's nothing like trying. Skiing can sometimes be classed as a sedentary occupation. There are some fine big snow fields in this part of the country. It's a fascinating place, this national park, with its three big mountains, Ruapeho, Tongariro, and Narohoe. The Maori legend says that this giant, Mount Egmont, used to stand near Ruapeho and Narohoe. There was a little bit of bother, so they say, the eternal triangle, of course, so Egmont stalked away. Standing 80 miles to the west of National Park, it rises from the flat dairying country of Taranaki, only 12 miles from the sea. This is one of the richest dairying districts in the world. And here we see horses pulling a konaki, or a farm sledge, across the paddock. Manure is taken out, hay is carted, and other farm chores are done with this vehicle. There are over four and a half million cattle in New Zealand and about a third of them are dairy cattle. The dairy industry is on the high road of prosperity with government guaranteed prices and bulk marketing of produce. Good morning, Pansy. Don't be afraid the camera won't snap you. Thousands of New Zealand families find happiness and security and hard work and good health farming here Dairy farming in these days is a science. And since it's no use living in a farming country if you don't make the most of it, a free milk service for all school children has been introduced by the government in recent years. And this scheme guarantees that every child shall have its proper supply. Vast quantities of butter and cheese are produced here in Taraki. Boxes of butter bearing the brand of the silver fern find their way to markets throughout the world.